Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Chopping Block's third demonstration for our Customer Appreciation Day. Executive Chef Lisa Counts is back in the kitchen, and she's going to be cooking up some amazing dishes that you're going to definitely want to have on your Thanksgiving table this year. A turkey roulade, scalloped potatoes, and a beautiful kale salad with roasted butternut squash and apples. Yum. My name is Andrea Miller. I'll be your moderator this afternoon. And um, this is a demonstration class. So you're going to stay on mute as you enter the, um, enter the meeting. And you're going to handle all your questions through the chat pane. But Lisa loves questions. And in our previous two demos, people are not holding back. So I want to see the same from you guys. Um, go ahead and just fire away. And we'll make sure all your questions are answered before we sign off for the afternoon. Thank you for those of you who are going ahead and putting your confirmation email in the chat pane. That confirmation uh, number, sorry, will be found in your email when you signed up for the class. It's in big blue numbers and letters, random, assigned to you individually. And you can pop that in the chat pane for me and I'll check you off of the roster. And another tip for you today is to watch the class in speaker view. You can actually toggle between speaker view and gallery view in the top right hand corner of your zoom screen and by staying in speaker view you'll be able to see everything that's happening in chef lisa's kitchen we actually have three cameras we're going to be toggling between today so you can see all of the action so that you guys have all the information so that you feel comfortable replicating these dishes at home on your own all right well let's get the party started with chef lisa Thank you so much, Andrea, and welcome. Good afternoon to you all. Thank you so much for joining me for this pre-Thanksgiving uh, demonstration. I'm super excited to teach you this menu. It's all of my favorite things. Um, we're going to talk about substitutions, different uses, um, and I'm going to walk you through every single technique for all of the recipes. So you did receive the recipes, and I know Andrew, I put them in the chat pane for you to follow along. That way you can ask me tons and tons of questions. The very first thing we're going to do is make our potato gratin. And then once that is in the oven, we're going to roast our butternut squash. And then we're going to move into our turkey. That's the big conversation. How to make a turkey roulade. What the heck is a roulade? So we're gonna learn all of that kind of stuff and more. And then finally, once everything is roasting up, we're gonna learn how to make a pan gravy, which is very important this time of year, and our salad, which is always great to act as a palate cleanser for all of these heavy, rich foods. So without further ado, let's make a potato gratin. So you'll see that I do have some things prepared in advance. I don't wanna to be too redundant with knife skills and prep work. Um, for our potato, our scallop potatoes, potato gratin, you know, these words get used interchangeably. Um, generally, a scallop potato or a potato gratin always implies cheese. So we are using a Gruyere and Swiss cheese today. If you're not familiar with Gruyere, it really is just a, a fancy Swiss, not so many holes. Um, but any kind of meltable cheese can work in this um, application. You'll see that I have some oven roasted garlic here. I pre-roasted all of my garlic until it became this wonderful oatmeal brown color. It takes on this wonderful sweet um, flavor and it's really, really soft. You can see I could just smash it in my fingers. So with this oven roasted garlic, I'm going to just smash it up with a fork. In your recipe packet, it does say that you can mince it, but I find just smashing it does the same exact job. Basically, we would just want it nice and small to steep in our heavy cream. And once it's all mushed up or minced up or smashed on your cutting board, we're gonna add this to one and a half cups of heavy cream. Now this is something that can easily be doubled or tripled depending on your baking vessel. I opted for a, a nine inch pie dish today. This is a meal Henri, it's um, enamel stoneware. So it's got this great finish that makes it virtually non-stick and the stoneware heats up great. Plus, it's just a beautiful presentation, but you can also do this in a 9 by 13 baking dish. You can make these in individual like ramekins, like, like this container that I'm smashing the garlic in right now. 
Um, so just remember, depending on your cooking vessel, you may need more potatoes and more cream, depending, okay? Now you'll see here on my stove top that I have my cream. I'm on a medium high heat. I don't want to be too high and boil over. Basically what I'm trying to do here is incorporate that garlic flavor, almost like you were steeping tea. I want the cream to take on that garlic flavor and melt out into it. And to this, I'm gonna add my fresh thyme. Now you'll see here that I just left it in one tight bundle. All I'm gonna do is throw that right in. Whatever falls off the stem, great. If it doesn't fall off the stem, I could just pick it all out later. This little chef hack really saves me some time. But our, psh. okay, we gotta start with the cheesy jokes, right? Ladies and gents, this is gonna be a fun demo. Um, but if you didn't wanna go pick out your stems, you know, I do this with rosemary a lot. Um, basically, all you're gonna do is hold it in your hand, pull the leaves right off, and you can rough chop those or throw them in whole. Thyme leaves really aren't that big. And by steeping them in the cream, they're gonna soften up. We're also gonna be baking this gratin in the oven. So it's really not that big of a deal if you have larger leaves. So that's why I like to just throw the whole thing in there and pick it out at the end. I just want that flavor in that cream. So you'll see that I have some of my potatoes already sliced here. Um, to get a nice even slice, I love using a mandolin, okay? Now with my mandolin, I can change the thickness by moving the um, dial up or down to get it as thick or as thick, thin as I want. And then I'm just gonna slide this down very carefully. Every so often I turn my potato, that way it cuts evenly and not on an angle and you'll see that I'm laying my hand flat that way I don't accidentally get my fingertips and now I have a bunch of even slices if you don't have a mandolin you can totally do this by hand with your knife you know very controlled movements but um, the biggest takeaway is just making sure that all of your potatoes are even um, you can make them thicker than this if you wanted, um, but as long as they're all the same size, they'll cook at the same rate. Does that make sense to everybody? So now for assembly, what we're going to do is I have my baking dish here. You can always pan spray it or lightly butter your dish. That's totally up to you. I'm just going to use a little pan spray today. And then the first thing we're gonna do is just start layering our potatoes. I like to shingle them so they're slightly touching and go in concentric circles, okay? This can be made with sweet potatoes. You can do a combination of potatoes and sweet potatoes. And then once I get one layer down, we're gonna season it with a little bit of salt and pepper. Now I'm gonna go a little bit off recipe here and I'm gonna use a little fancy truffle salt in my layers, little added flavor here. So just a light coating, not a heavy salt, but each layer should be seasoned with salt and pepper, okay? You can see here, I'm gonna bring my pot over to the front. I have boiled up. So that means I am ready to go. We're not looking to reduce our cream at all. Just incorporate those flavors. You can see I'm steaming pretty high now. So all I'm gonna do is take out my bunch of thyme. I'm gonna make sure I'm not gonna flip my spatula. So I'm just gonna take this whole bunch of thyme right out and compost. I've extracted enough flavor out of it. So now I'm ready to use this. Now I'm not seasoning my cream because I know I'm seasoning every layer of potatoes. So then I just put a little bit 
just one ladle. This is a two ounce ladle just to get it um, covering that first layer. And then we're gonna keep going. Now, if you were doing this in a nine by 13, I would just do lines of potatoes. If you were doing individual, depending on how big your ramekin or vessel is, you can always just go layers straight up and down. There is no right or wrong with assembly. All right, a little bit of truffle salt, a little bit of pepper, a little bit of cream. Now you can put cheese on every single layer. You can alternate layers, but the biggest and most important thing to know about adding your cheese I'm gonna use a little bit of this sliced for my layers, is just remember to save some cheese for the very top layer. And remember, when you're assembling this, cheese brings on its own salt content, right? So be aware of how much seasoning you're actually adding to each of these layers. Doesn't take much to season those potatoes. Any questions so far, ladies and gents? Not so far, but I want to remind everybody that if you're in the Chicagoland area today, if you place any orders for retail products, you get 20% off, and then we're doing wine at 10% off. Unfortunately, for those of you outside of Chicago, we're not yet shipping again. Um, but if you are in town, you can place your orders today. You'll get those discounts. You can pick them up today until 5, or you can choose another pickup window um, in our safe curbside pickup on Tuesdays and Saturdays three to five. That's an excellent point, Andrea. These pie dishes at 20% off are a steal. Yeah. And they come in a variety of different colors. Who knew a pie dish was used for more than just pies, right? I love these as a serving vessel. Oh, I use mine for so many things, like even dips for parties because they look so pretty. Oh yeah, spinach and artichoke dip in this thing. Mm. Uh, Colleen says she uses Swiss cheese that wasn't grated. That works too. Absolutely, Colleen. Totally. You know, I have a combination of some grated and some not grated. I decided to use my sliced for in between layers. And then I'm gonna finish this off. I'm gonna use all of these potatoes here. And this was four potatoes for your reference that I sliced with the mandolin. So once we get to this final layer, a little bit more of that truffle salt. And I really do prefer truffle salt over truffle oil. Um, it just has a, a better, more natural flavor compared to truffle oil. So top layer, salt and pepper. And I lost count. I think I did three or four layers. <laughs> We're gonna pour the rest of our cream all around. And you'll notice here that I still have some of those pieces of garlic. We're gonna put those all around. And even if you got some of that fresh thyme in there still, no big deal, just pick it off. All right. Uh, now, what was your setting on your mandolin for slicing the potatoes? Was it about a quarter inch thickness? Yes, they were about a little less than quarter inch. It's probably in between an eighth and a quarter. And then this very last layer, we are going to top it with all the cheese. Everybody loves that nice melty top crust of cheese. But like I said, any kind of multiple cheese can work. Um, other root vegetables that I've done gratins with besides sweet potatoes, I've done this with celery root. I've done this with, um, I've done a fennel and potato gratin. I've put caramelized onions in between layers to kind of bulk it up. And there you have it folks. So the last thing we're gonna do before we put this in the oven is we're gonna cover this with foil. And one of my little chef hats with foil is, if you're covering something, make sure the shiny part touches your food. 
that shininess um, really helps reflect the food away. But always remember to oil your foil. So either a little bit of pan spray or even a light coating of oil on your foil. Once you put that down on your cheese, it won't stick and you won't rip off that top layer of cheese that way. I do that with lasagnas, gratons. Always remember, oil the foil. And I'm not creating a really tight seal on my uh, gratin. It's not necessary, mainly because I wanna preserve that, that cheesy crust. But as long as you have it mostly covered, this ensures that our cheese won't burn on top before cooking thoroughly. And about halfway through, we'll take the foil off to really get some nice golden brown melty spots on our cheese on top. So into the oven we go. Middle shelf. Not too close to the bottom. That way our bottom doesn't burn before cooking. I always want to be right around that middle shelf. Um, with gratins in general, maybe we're cooking a bunch of things. Like today, we have roasted squash. We have this gratin. We're cooking a turkey all in one oven. So right now, my oven is actually set for 425 degrees. Even though your recipe for just this gratin says 375, um, that's why I want to be a little higher up because I know that the bottom of my oven cooks a lot faster, it's going to brown a lot faster, but it's a lot, it's a lot easier to cook multiple things at a higher temperature than a low temperature, right? Because once we're too low, we're going to end up steaming, we're not going to get the right kind of browning or caramelization. So when in doubt, always um, err on the side of your highest temperature for whatever recipe you're doing. Does that make sense to everybody? Is anybody uh, cooking along with me at home? No, we, we have all a just... lot of diligent note takers, though. I love, love it. Well, please ask me tons of questions. I know that's pretty straightforward. Oh, another little pro tip with this gratin. You can make this the night before your dinner. It tastes so much better reheated. And when you are reheating, just keep it covered with foil at 375 degrees until it reaches 165 in the center, which is roughly 25 to 30 minutes. And then you can always pull that foil off to rebrown the top if necessary. But by chilling it and reheating it the next day, it absorbs so much more of that liquid. I don't know how many of you have ever taken a bite of like a cheesy gratin and it's still all liquidy. This really gives it a chance to settle. So this is something that can totally be made in advance um, so just FYI there. So the next thing that we're going to do is learn how to cut the word, the world's hardest vegetable, which is butternut squash. I can totally appreciate that it can be very difficult to get this thing cut. So I'm going to give you some of my tips and tricks now. So I did already peel my butternut squash. Um, you know, when you are peeling, just try to go in one direction down. It seems to work the best. When I am cutting my butternut squash, I'm going to chop off the, the bottom and the top. And then I look to see where it is bulbous and where it is a little more slender. This slender part is solid butternut squash. This bulbous part is um, hollow and has seeds. All right, give me one second. Okay. Going back to the scallop potatoes, could you bake it or sorry, could you make it the day before and bake it the next day or would you recommend? Totally. Yes, totally. Um, it'll last. Just keep it covered in your fridge. And then when you do go to cook it, um, it might take a little longer to cook because it, it is coming straight from cold, but you can totally have this whole thing assembled in your fridge, bake it when ready. Um, you beat me to 165. This is why I love Andrea, best moderator ever. Keep those questions coming, folks. So holding my knife really choked up in my hand, we call this the pinch grip. That way my middle finger is curled around the handle, starting with the tip of my knife down 
in this down and forward motion, okay? Now I'm doing this very slow so you get what I'm, I'm going for, but tip down and it's slight pressure down and forward, okay? You'll notice that I keep rocking my knife up and down. Do not be tempted to just, when you get stuck, push down, okay? It's everybody's number one reaction, but what happens is you're putting so much pressure straight down that it's actually harder for your knife to cut. Whereas if you're sliding and gliding forward and putting pressure down, the knife is doing the work and you don't have to work so hard. But what you want to try to avoid is hearing that in the kitchen. That just means we are dulling our knife. And just like that, by rocking up and down, I have nice pretty edges that I can go ahead and dice these guys, okay? Now, whenever you are roasting um, vegetables, you always want to be on a pretty high oven. That's why I said I preheated at 425 degrees, okay? We are going to cut these into just nice little dices. You can cut your dices as big or as small as you prefer for your salad. In our salad, we're going to have some apples and some pomegranates. So I'm going to try to keep everything uh, roughly the same size. When it gets awkward to hold, always make sure that you're using what I like to call the London Bridge. By holding it stable in between your fingers, you always know where your fingers are at but now I can come straight down and get even slices. So once you have these nice big planks, <laughs> is what I like to call them, wide surface areas, I can cut those planks into slices and then turn those slices into dices. Now, however big or small you make your, your planks, determines you know how big or small your dice is the smaller you make your slices the smaller you make your dices and that really is just preferential the biggest takeaway is just making sure that they're all roughly the same size that way they cook at the same rate now i'm not too worried about this curved end i like rustic cut vegetables you know they don't actually have to be 100% square, but I still know that they're the same size as everything else. Now, you can always get all of your squash cut. You know, the day before, they don't really oxidize the same way as, you know, other vegetables, and then just roast them off whenever you're ready. They'll take roughly for this size, about 20 to 25 minutes to, to bake. And if you're not familiar with butternut squash, you know, the higher the temperature, the better, because then we'll get nice, even golden brown without turning into mush. Now, Lisa, Carrie had a question that I think others would have. Um, could you use the frozen diced butternut squash for this recipe? The frozen diced butternut squash, was that the question? Yes. Um, you could, but I think with that kind of stuff, you're actually more suited to just saute over high heat. Um, just because I worry about the amount of water that it retained when you put it in the oven, I'm just worried about it steaming too much. I don't think you'll achieve the same level of caramelization that we're really looking for where we have some nice browning happening. Um, but quite honestly, I've never purchased the already frozen stuff, but that would just be my, my educated guess. Usually frozen vegetables are, are par cooked. So by roasting them in the oven, you might, uh, they might get a little soggy before um, browning. So in that case, a high heat saute pan where you can just saute it up in a little bit of oil. Now you'll notice that I'm just uh, scraping the inside here. You know, with butternut squash, it, it has almost the same texture of like a pumpkin wood once it's cooked. So this is gonna get, you know, some nice browning around the edges. It's gonna be soft and 
and pumpkin-like in the center, just like most uh, fall and winter squashes. Now you'll see that I'm just taking this curved end and making them into little strips. With those strips, I'm gonna do the same exact thing, just cut them into dices and using my best judgment, cutting off this smaller end because I know that will burn. And now I have a more even um, size compared to my other stuff. Sometimes when I'm working with butternut squash, I don't even use this hollowed out part for, for dicing because it does tend to be a little un uneven. And for demonstration purposes, I'm gonna save this guy off to the side because my sheet tray is getting kind of full, okay? Now, one of the things that you should know about roasting in your oven is you really don't wanna overload your sheet tray. Everything should be in a nice even layer. If you need to divide it up amongst multiple sheet trays, I highly recommend that. Just because we won't uh, get the same even cooking if we're all jammed in there. But that looks pretty good. I have a nice even layer. Even if they're touching a little bit, that's not the end of the world. Because once I throw these in the oven, I'm not going to um, stir it up or anything like that. They're just going to cook as is. So I'm using grapeseed oil to go into my oven. I put my finger over the lid. That way I can give myself a little more even control about how much is coming out instead of just pouring it in. An even sprinkling of salt and pepper. And then for a little bit of kick, we're gonna add some cayenne pepper to this as well. You know, squash lends itself to spicy. Um, one of my favorite seasonings to use on squashes is ancho chili. Cause it has that smoky flavor that plays off the, the sweetness of the winter squash. So I'm just gonna give this a little sprinkle of cayenne. I like things spicy around here. <laughs> and there you have it. Oil, salt, pepper, a little cayenne. I like to foil my sheet tray for oven roasting vegetables, um, but parchment or a silk hat works just as well. And this is something that I do like to put on my bottom shelf because by putting it on the bottom, I'm, I know the bottom of my oven heats up really, really well. So I'm gonna get this really nice golden brown um, crunchy crust on one side while the rest of it roasts and, and softens up. So then we'll have some texture difference, we'll have some caramelization happening, which basically means all the natural sugars are, are browning and that brings out flavor. Now, Michael, personally, I don't like butternut squash seeds. I don't think that they really toast as well as like pumpkin seeds do, but it's not out of the realm of possibilities. If you have the patience to separate it from all the insides of the butternut squash, go for it. Any other questions so far before we move on to our turkey conversation? I think you have got them all. Awesome. So with my turkey, I have a lot of stuff going on here. Let's talk about the filling first. We have prosciutto. Um, the prosciutto is just already sliced prosciutto that I just cut up into smaller pieces, okay? You can also um, use bacon if you want. You can use a uh, pancetta that's been cooked off. Um, but because this is already cooked, I mean, even just a diced ham would work too, or you can omit it if you don't want to do pork. Um, I have some diced up cranberries. These cranberries have just been, you know, rough chopped into smaller pieces. And then I have our sage. With our sage, once again, just chopped up nicely. I did a nice little chiffonade, which means thin um, ribbons, but anything. The biggest takeaway with this recipe, ladies and gents, is going to be the process of 
pounding, how to roll this and tie it up in some twine. Because then once you understand that process, you can stuff your turkey with just about anything. You can stuff chicken breasts. You can, you know, sky's the limit when it comes to this process. For boot camp, we do a tapenade that we stuff inside uh, a pork that I tie up with twine. But I really like this little vessel because it's stainless steel, it can just live on your countertop. This is a lot easier to clean um, than having twine rolling around, you're touching meat products, that kind of thing. So I really do like having this around. And then I found this, we, we carry this chicken rub. Now you could just use regular old salt and pepper, but I'm gonna use this chicken and poultry rub because it does add some extra flavor to our turkey as well. There's some brown sugar, there's paprika, there's other spices, star anise, garlic. So that's going to make a wonderful addition with all of these as well. So with our turkey breast, I have it in between some plastic right now because I didn't want to get juices everywhere. I'm going to put on some gloves so when we do start wrapping this, I'm ready to go. But if you've never pounded out a protein before, the reason why we pound things out is for even cooking. Now with turkey breast, I have a bigger side, I have a thinner side. So by pounding this out, my goal is just to make it nice and even and give me a large surface area so I can stuff and roll. Now in your recipe packet, it says to butterfly it. My breast wasn't really that big, so I didn't need to butterfly it. But if you did, all that means is cutting halfway or cutting where it is the fattest and just flipping it over to the side, almost like a book, okay? Um, but because mine isn't that thick, I really didn't have to um, butterfly it. Now I have this heavy duty mallet here. For most things, you only need to use this flat side for this uh, side. That's more breaking down and um, tenderizing meat, which isn't the case here. And there is a method to the madness. It's not just a straight up and down pounding. It's a down and out motion, okay? So what I mean by that is I follow the direction of the meat you'll see which way the uh, meat muscle runs. And then I follow those lines and I go down and out following those lines. So it's almost kind of like I'm smashing and moving the meat where I need to go. And for me being right-handed, it's really easy for me to go this way. So that's what I'm gonna do. I rotate my meat, my proteins, to pound it down and out. Now, if you end up with small holes, it's not the end of the world, because once we roll it and fill it with stuffing, it's not gonna matter. Now, I like doing this in between plastic because then I can see what's happening but you can also do this in, um, in between parchment. This is my really thick end right here. Has anybody ever done anything like this before? Stuffed and rolled or pounded out a protein? I like to do a flank steak. Ooh, yeah. Flank steak's a good one. I'm Italian, so I grew up eating lots of rolled flank steak. Gotta love that brujol. <laughs> All right, so I pounded a hole right through my plastic wrap, but that's okay. So now what we're gonna do, being very careful, When you're looking at your turkey breast, you know, that top um, thick side, we're always going to, 
and I have a little hole right there. I just smash that together. Um, you're always going to roll uh, horizontally like this. So if this was that that fat side and this is the tail side, I'm always going to roll that way. The reason being, a, I'll have more you know slicing to give to people. But B, because this is the way the, the muscle, the breast muscle runs, by rolling it up that way, it's going to naturally want to hold. Whereas if I tried to roll this way, I'd end up with more of, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a, a spiral effect instead of a stuffing effect. So what we're going to do is season this guy up, okay? And we're going to take a... Uh, a little bit of my chicken seasoning. Now this has salt in it, so I don't have to add any extra salt, but always be aware of your spice mixes. Look at the, um, the label because not all spice mixes have salt and some that do, you wanna make sure that you're not over seasoning. Okay. Do you know how many pounds your chicken breast was, or I'm sorry, your turkey breast was? This was probably about two and a half, three pounds as a breast. And how thin did you pound it to? So great question. It's kind of delicate, so that's why I didn't want to show it, but it's about a quarter inch thick. And our recipe calls for skin on, but yours does not have skin, correct? Um, there's partial skin. So depending on who butchers your, your meats, and it's funny because my parents just bought a turkey breast. They're getting ready for Thanksgiving. And they said that they got a really nice big one at a great price at Costco. So check out Costco. Um, it's boneless um, and it's it has skin on it. And they said that it was a really good deal. But um, depending on who butchers your, your turkey, sometimes the skin comes off. Sometimes there's just a little bit of skin. Um, so whatever you can get with skin, go for it. But it's not that big of a deal if, it's, if, if it doesn't have skin. So I'm just layering this with the prosciutto and the sage and the cranberries. You know, prosciutto brings in its own salt content too. So you wanna make sure you're not over seasoning. I'm gonna really pat that in there. You'll notice that I've left a small area around the edge that's not, that doesn't have filling. That way, as I roll, things are gonna naturally go towards the ends. So that's why I'm not too worried um, about having the filling everywhere. And Lisa, before you demonstrate the rolling, can you clarify again which side you're rolling from and why? Oh, yes. So whatever your thickest side was, think of it as like the top side of the breast. Um, so if if this is the, the fat side and this is the tail side, you want to roll accordingly, meaning that the fat side and the thin side are, are your end pieces and not roll from the thin side to the fatter side or vice versa. Does that make sense? So basically what I'm looking at is the muscle is going this way and I'm rolling in the direction of the muscle. And I wanna make sure that this is making sense for everybody. So please, if, if I'm not being clear, ask me those questions. And I'm pounding out the back side. So this opposite side that's that's face down right now that you can't see, that's where the skin side is. And so now what I'm gonna do is start folding over in a nice even line to get one section um, over, I kind of tuck in that filling and then I just keep rolling away from me. Just 
I already see one hole, but I'm not worried at all. So another way to think about this too is think about your length of roulade. Meaning, and I'm gonna transfer this. You want your roulade to feed many people. And so if I were to roll this short way up, I would end up with a really short but fat roulade. Whereas this way, I have a nice longer roulade that I can do multiple slices off of and feed a lot of people. All right. So I have this roulade. I'm not worried about open sections. That's where the twine comes in. Depending on what your ends look like, you can always fold those in as well to keep your stuffing from falling out. Okay. And now for the twine. What I like to do is I always work vertically. Okay. And I make one nice big tie, tie it as tight as you can, and then double knot. And I leave a little bit of string hanging away from me. I have plenty of, of lead on my string. I have my canister out of the way so it's not getting full of meat. And then what I like to do, you can always just cut sections and make little rings. But what I like to do is make a little loop around my hand, lift up and then bring that end down. So now it's just one big giant piece of, of string instead of having to cut multiple strings. Okay, and I'll kind of show you what this looks like from this end. So I make a little circle around my hand and lift this up and I just drag it down the side of my turkey. And this is gonna hold our are filling in. It's going to keep this in a nice tight circle um, or roulade, hence the name. Basically just fancy for roll up. <laughs> um, and I just keep pulling this nice and tight. Now, if this motion does not make any sense to you, I completely get it. It's an acquired uh, skill. But once you get it down, it's so much faster and quicker and more efficient than trying to tie one, two, three, four, five, six different sections of string. Now, once you get to the end, and this is a really great example because it's always gonna happen on that, that smaller end, this is where I like to kind of regroup my filling, roll this over and then tuck it in that way, I can get my last string to hold that in place. Now, once you get really good at making these, these knots and these cross sections, then you can really be cognizant of how far apart they are because there is a reasoning behind this. We're gonna sear this in a hot pan. Once we start to form a crust on this, it's going to be really hard to slice and present um, through that really thick crust. So where you pull the twine off later, that's going to be your slicing marks. So you can make those as big or as small as you want. Now, I measured the length of my, my turkey, okay, and then I cut the end. Then we can get rid of that guy. Are there any questions? I know that this is, you know, a lot to take in, especially virtually, but I, I really hope you, you get this because, um, you know, once you understand this technique, stuffing foods like this, especially turkey, 
which it's a very lean protein. We've all had, you know, overcooked dried turkey breast for Thanksgiving. But what this filling's gonna do is create some excellent moisture, okay, in order to keep everything um, nice and juicy. So on this side, I'm just pulling this through a couple little uh, sections, okay? It's just an over under, just to hold it in place. And then I come back and I tie the top end. Can everybody see that? That little string that I left earlier. We're just gonna tie that in a double knot. And voila, we have our turkey rod. And you can see where I do have some skin. <laughs> Well, Valerie asked, why would you want to keep the skin on? At that point, why, like, because I only have some of it, why would I keep it on? Well, why would we, uh, why would we specify a skin on turkey breast and the rest? Gotcha. Of uh, and that's a really good question. So as I'm answering, I'm going to season this up with just some salt and pepper around the outside. I always use spoons in my big container. Sometimes I'll make like a pile. That way I'm not touching everything with turkey hands. Um, but the skin, best part of the turkey, if you ask me. Once it gets really golden brown and delicious and crispy, um, it's, it's just beautiful. Um, it gives us some nice texture. So that's why we wanna keep the skin on. It's also a protectant from the outside drying out. Um, you know, this gets crispy and golden brown without drying out the, the non-skin part. Does that make sense? But that's really kind of what we're going for. Just so it looks like Michael is actually uh, preparing this dish with, with you, Lisa, and he's saying he's having a hard time getting the breast so thin. I mean, I know one of your tricks is that beautiful roast the meat mallet that we have, but do you have any other suggestions in case he doesn't have maybe a quality mallet? Um, so, Michael, can I see you? Do you mind if we spotlight you so I can see how thick your turkey is? Oh yeah, you got one. Oh no, that's great. You have plenty of surface area. If you see any thick parts, which I, it's kind of hard to tell, you know, in in this virtual world, but I think you're quite literally ready to roll. I think that'll work out great. I'm jealous of how big yours is. I know. <laughs> I have like a little baby turkey breast, um, but really as long as it's even, Michael, that's the biggest deal. As long as you have a nice big surface area and it's even all the way around, you can get away with being a little thicker because you do have so much more to roll. All right, so we're seasoned up with salt and pepper. We're stuffed, we're, we're tied up. Now it's time to get this baby cooking. So over high heat, you know, I'm fortunate enough that I have this um, thermometer in the bottom of my pan. I've been preheating my pan this whole entire time, okay? So once it gets to the red, which means searing, I know that I am ready to cook my turkey. I am looking to be right around 400 degrees. I'm gonna be using my high smoke point oil, which is my grapeseed oil. Once I put my oil in, I should see little wisps of smoke. I want to make sure that I have plenty of oil to evenly coat the bottom. And then we're going to put this right in. Now, if yours does have skin, we're going to put that skin side down first. Because I have that little hole Got to make sure I clean my cutting board real quick while that is steering. Always got to keep it clean, ladies and gents. Especially when you're talking about poultry. Yeah. All right. So on this side, 
I am not looking to cook this all the way through. I'm just looking to get a nice crust forming. The skin side goes down first, so it gets the ultimate browning. Then I'm gonna rotate it on all the sides. Um, once I see just a little bit of golden brown everywhere, then I'm gonna transfer it into my roasting pan. I'm gonna hang on to this saute pan though, because that's gonna be the saute pan that I use to make my gravy. Um, if you don't have a roasting pan, at the very least, you wanna just roast this on something, not directly on the metal, okay? That's our, our ideal. We need to have some kind of uh, rack in there to create some even airflow so our turkey cooks evenly. So it's roughly a minute or two on each side. If you're at that 400 degrees, you can see that golden brown happening. Got some great color, great caramelization. And you wanna do this on all four sides. Now, while this is searing, I'm gonna check out my gratin to see if I'm bubbling. Once I know I'm bubbling and my potatoes have softened up, then I know I'm ready to take off my foil. Any other questions so far, ladies and gents? So just the fact that everybody wants to go to Michael's house for dinner tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if you make any purchases today, for one, you'll get 20% off retail merchandise and 10% off of alcohol, correct, Andrea? Yeah. Wine and spirits. Yes. But I'm giving away the food I'm making with everybody who purchases. So if you are in the neighborhood, if you need any of these awesome utensils, I'm going to make nice little plates of my gratin, my turkey, my gravy, and my salad. So then you get a nice little dinner on the side too. So Michael, I'm not turning my squash at all. Um, I am just letting it get a really nice golden brown crust on the bottom. And then once it's fork tender, I pull it out. So Andrea, I think you can help Colleen. Yes, I will get there. One second, I'm gonna give you the price of the pie pan. So it's 32.02, but that's before the 20% discount. And please don't make me do any math because that's not my strong point other than recipe calculations. Um, so Colleen, if you go to the shop tab, the top of our website, you'll see several pages um, based on the category. So there's baking tools, knives, cookware, wine. We have a special case of wine going on right now. Um, you'll be able to see all the products there. There's actually a, about 170 products. So I think there's quite a few. So if there's something that you know we normally carry that you don't see, um, you know, let me know and I'll let you know if we have it in stock. Um, but otherwise you can just pick and choose and all those prices do include tax. So that 3302 I put in there for the meal on price is with tax. And then you would just subtract, subtract the 20% discount, um, obviously 10% offline and spirit. All right. So that's another question about the rack. You did have a rack on your sheet tray there, or your roasting pan. Yes. If you look at my close up right now, it's exactly what I want to show you. So I have great color on all my sides of my, my turkey. Okay. See, those holes didn't even matter, right? Because I have the twine. I'm not even worried about some of the stuffing coming out. But there is a rack that comes out of this roasting pan. Uh, we have different uh, shapes and sizes on our website. But uh, the biggest takeaway is the reason why I'm, I'm on a rack is to promote airflow. If I was directly on this pan, what would happen is the bottom would start to get really crispy crunchy and overcook before this top part cooks evenly. So what I'd like to do is because I know I need to use this pan, I'll just pour this hot fat right out over my, my turkey. 
Um, you don't have to do that. You can always pour it off to the side, but I like just throwing it in there. Sometimes I'll throw a little bit of water in the bottom of my roasting pan. That way it doesn't start to burn. And then this is gonna go in our oven as well. Um, this is something that it can be top or bottom shelf. It can be just about anywhere in your oven and it works out nicely. So we have our squash still roasting. I need a little more time. I don't know how far you guys are, but I see a little bit of browning, but still a little tough, not so tender yet. Um, my gratin did start to bubble a little bit around the edges. Um, so I left the foil on. I'm gonna check it in a, in a few more minutes, then pull that off to really get nice and golden brown on top, get that cheese all melty. Um, and our, our turkey's in. So now we're gonna do all of our other knife skills. We're gonna get our salad all ready. We're gonna make a vinaigrette to go with that. We'll get that tossed up and set aside and then move on to our gravy next. Oh, I see the twine coming out in Michael's kitchen. <laughs> all right. So first things first, let's make our vinaigrette. In this bowl right now, I have some minced shallot, some Dijon, and some apple cider vinegar, okay? Um, you know, your recipe packet says three to four tablespoons of apple cider vinegar. That's really your preference based on, you know, your acidity likes. I like things pretty high acid um, to complement all the flavors in this. So I went with four tablespoons, okay? Um, but it is about a teaspoon of honey and a teaspoon of Dijon. Okay, I'm gonna show you how I mince that shallot because I feel like it's a skill that everybody needs. So with our, our half a shallot, I cut off a little bit of the top end, but I'm leaving the root end on. And I'm just gonna peel this guy. Now, what I'm gonna do is make little incisions going all the way down to my cutting board, but not through that root end. I'm just using the tip of my knife and I'm going in an angular direction, meaning I'm following all the radial cuts instead of just coming straight up and down, because by doing that, I've cut through everything I need to my root is holding it all intact, and I can make this really nice and small for my vinaigrette. Just cutting against those lines. The same rules apply for onions as well. And that is our minced shallot. So we'll add that to our salad bowl. We're going to add some orange zest with our almighty microplane. What I like to do is just drag along one direction, just kind of rotating my orange as I go. By just dragging it in one direction like this, it all collects here. I'm putting very light pressure on, so I'm not getting any of that deep pith which can be very bitter. I'm just getting those essential oils. Now, a lot of times I see, and what's great about this is you can just push it right into your bowl. But a lot of times what I see is people pushing really hard in both directions. And by pushing hard, you're gonna get deep down in there, but by going in multiple directions back and forth, you're gonna end up dulling your microplane. So to prolong the life of your microplane, just always great in one direction. So we have our orange zest, we have our shallot, our vinegar, our honey, our Dijon. Last thing, our extra virgin olive oil. So whenever you're making a vinaigrette, you always want to start with all of your flavoring agents, everything but the oil. Then once you have everything mixed together, you can slowly pour 
your oil in. And by pouring it really slow and mixing really fast, it'll start to get a little thicker. And then as it gets thicker, we can always stop and taste. In your recipe packet, it does call for a half a cup of oil. You'll notice that I'm not even measuring because I like to go off of my taste buds, not what a recipe tells me. So I taste a little bit. And if it's still really acidic or it's still really um, um, strong in flavor from the Dijon or the vinegar, we're gonna keep on adding oil. If you find that it's balanced enough, then, then you're ready to go. Traditionally, a vinaigrette is three parts of oil, so one part of vinegar. And I tend to be more of an equal parts kind of person. I like those strong flavors. I don't want to dull them out with uh, oil, but that's totally up to you. Oh yeah, now we're starting to get brown. Had a nice little tuft of smoke come out. I don't know if you guys saw that. One of my butternut squash fell off the sheet tray. <laughs> so it's just dying in the back of my onion, of, of my onion or my oven right now. Um, so that's our vinaigrette. Last thing we have to do, we season. A little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper. And we are going to dice our apple next. And I'm going to show you my pomegranate trick. If you ever buy fresh pomegranates, I'm going to teach you a really easy way to get them out of the, the shell. So with our apple, what I like to do is cut a little bit off the bottom, okay? Always remember to take off your stickers. The reason why I like to cut off a little bit of the bottom is because now it's nice and stable. Because I want to cut this um, in a medium dice, just like my butternut squash, what I'm going to end up doing is cutting around the core and the seeds. This size is going to be perfect to just cut into small pieces. These bigger pieces, what I'm going to do is cut slices and then turn those slices into dices. But this, once again, is preferential too. If you don't like red apples, you can use green apples. You can make these bigger or smaller or whatever size you prefer. And I'm gonna throw this in my salad bowl with my baby kale. I am going to pull out my butternut squash now. I don't know how your kitchen is smelling right now, but mine is delicious. So what I wanna show you is this really nice caramelization that we have on our butternut squash straight out of the oven. This is why I just leave it on one side so we get that nice crisp golden brown, but the rest of it's really nice and tender, okay? I highly suggest not just grabbing your butternut squash out of the oven. This is hot, but um, but that's what we're going for, okay? Got a quality control. Delicious. All right. It's kind of crazy how smoky it got here. <laughs> um, you can actually see it coming out of the back of my oven. Um, so the, the next thing I want to do is show you about this pomegranate trick. And then we will start making our gravy. Are there any other uh, questions we got? Terry just asked if you could use other types of apples besides sweet. Oh, for sure. Any kind of apples, pears would be really nice in this salad too. I'm a big fan of Granny Smith apples. Those are my favorite. Um, but any, anything you got, anything you can find. So, with pomegranate, what you want to do is cut it through the equator, okay? 
not pole to pole, if that makes sense. You want to cut it in half through the equator. That shows all of the seeds and it cuts through all of the membrane. Whereas if you were to go pole to pole, all of those would be hidden. So the next thing I like to do is I get a bowl of water, just regular old water from the tap. And I'm gonna turn this upside down. I'm gonna hold it in my hand very carefully. And I'm gonna use a spoon and just knock the seeds right out. And you're just going to keep tapping, keep tapping. And they just fall right out of the bottom. I find it's easier to hold it from underneath than trying to hold it on the side and get them to come out just because it does get a little slippery. But you can see some of them are still stuck in there. You're just going to keep tapping. If you hit it right on that center part, then it'll all start releasing. This was a nice beefy pomegranate. Lots of seeds in here. So you can see how they're starting to come out now. Just a few left on the sides. But by just giving it a tap, they come out on their own instead of trying to dig into all those pockets. And then you start breaking open the seeds. There we go. Nothing left. And then you'll notice, so there's always going to be some white um, part of that, that pithy part that comes out with it. So by putting this in a bowl of water, all the seeds drop to the bottom where all the other stuff that you don't want to eat will float to the top. So I give this a little bit of a stir and then I just scoop this out. You can do this with a slotted spoon. Um, I do bring out a strainer that you can just collect all of that stuff. And then you just strain out all your pomegranates and you're good to go. Has anybody ever done a pomegranate like this before? I haven't. I usually stick it under the water. So this is different. So yeah, I keep on giving it a little stir. That way more of the stuff will come up to the surface that you don't want. And I'm just going to strain these off in my sink if there's any other questions. Yeah, everybody has their own pomegranate tricks, I think. <laughs> this one's good because you can get out some frustration. Yeah, you know, I always like giving it the nice little tap, tap, tap room. All right. So. Well, I'm in here. We're gonna take out the gratin. Because I had a nice little baby turkey, my turkey is just about done. So we'll start with, let me show you. The gratin. So I'm bubbling around the sides. I have great golden brown pockets. I'm nice and melty. So how do I know I'm done? I like to stick a knife right down the center. You should go straight through without any um um Resistance? Yes, resistant. Good word. No resistance. <laughs> this is what happens when I talk for three hours. I yeah. use my words. Um, so now, basically, what you go off of is, okay, there's no resistance. I know my potatoes are cooked all the way. Do I want more color on top? That's totally up to you. Um, but I, I do know 
it's really nice and melty. You guys look at that. It's so good. Um, so that's really preferential. I prefer melty um, with pockets of brown because then it's not, it's, it's, it's more of a texture thing for me. But here's the big takeaway too. Depend, no matter what vessel you're cooking in, always make sure you're cooking on a sheet tray because you're bound to cook over the sides just like so, okay? This was half of my smoking problem right here is the cream was coming off onto my sheet tray. Um, but that's with everything. Whenever I, I, I bake um, in my cast iron or like a pie dish or even a nine by 13, I, I went all the way up to the side so it is boiling over. Always use sheet tray for that. All right, so we'll set that off to the side. We have our turkey here, okay? I just gave it a, a little poke and it, it's firm to the touch. So I know I, I've got to be close. So when in doubt, use your thermometer. But here's the deal. you got to be very careful where you're taking the temperature on this. I, I go into where there was like a hole or some of that stuffing coming out. But I really want to make sure that I'm, I'm as close to the center as possible. And I try to get it into the actual turkey. Um, sometimes the filling can give you uh, a different temperature. And I want to make sure the turkey's cooked all the way through. I'm not really worried about the filling, if that makes sense. So I'm going to test it in a couple of different locations just to make sure. Now, always remember, when you are roasting anything, okay, they say turkey needs to be cooked to 155, 165 degrees, but here's the deal. Once you hit that mark, you've already cooked through, and we're hitting that dry part of the uh, turkey. So I always like to pull this a little under, closer to, you know, 145, because I know I need to let my turkey rest before I start slicing into it. And during this rest time, it is going to keep cooking. It is going to keep carrying over. So I might need to put this back in just for a second longer. Let's make sure the turkey's cooked through. What time are you looking to pull the turkey at, Lisa? I personally always shoot uh, for 140 with turkey, 145, which is more like a medium rare steak than anything. But like I said, that we've been roasting at such a high temperature. We have that stuffing in there to prevent it from overcooking um, by pulling it earlier and letting it really um, rest and carry over cook then we're gonna cook through without losing any of that moisture. So Gina, yes, I would say 145 is your ideal. And then the question from Rana about the amount of liquid on the gratin, is that gonna absorb as it rests? Yes, yes. And that's why I say that this is always better the next day um, because it will, all the potatoes are gonna soak up all that liquid. Like I would never wanna just dip in with a spoon right now to this because it would be all liquidy but if um you uh if you let it sit then it'll get nice and thick um today because i was doing all of these multiple things i was at that 425 degree mark um ordinarily if i'm just doing one of these or certain things i wouldn't be that high for everything mainly just roasting the vegetables so if I if I'm just doing the squash, then yeah, 425 is great. If I'm just doing this turkey, I would drop it down more to a 375 or 400 range. You don't need to be that high. Um, but for purposes of this demonstration, I just wanted to keep one solid temperature throughout. Um, does that so, make sense, everybody? Yeah, I think the only. Uh, outstanding question is uh, for a regular turkey breast without the stuffing. Um, so if we were just a whole roast of turkey breast, right? Um, let's say it doesn't have the bone in it. I would still sear it on that skin side. Just 
for a minute or two on that not skin side and then throw it in a 400 degree oven and you're gonna actually pull that a little later. You're gonna pull that closer to 150 because it doesn't have that stuffing and you're just looking to cook it all the way through. You need to make sure that fat side on the turkey breast is at least 150 because then as it carries over, it will reach its correct temperature. Great questions, guys. I want to make this approachable for you in your own kitchen. I want to be able to teach you the things that you need to know to recreate this. So please keep them coming. And just remember, if you get a turkey breast with a bone in, bone in is going to take longer to cook. But that bone insulates you from overcooking. So that's it really is a plus. So you want to make sure that you're taking your temperature close to that bone. You always want to be parallel to the bone, not perpendicular to the bone with your thermometer. So keep that in mind as well. All right, so we are going to make our gravy next while our turkey finishes cooking. Um, and then we'll toss our salad out and we'll see how everything turns out in a little bit. Oh, Michael, can you please hold that up? Because that looks delightful. Oh, Great yes. job. Yeah. Bravo. Lana, yes, of course. You can assemble the roulade the night before. Just have it wrapped in your fridge. And just um, when you do go to cook it the next day, just make sure you keep it out on your countertop for an hour or two so you're not going directly from your refrigerator to your pan. That's the biggest thing. You want to let it kind of come up to room temperature before starting to cook it. So is everybody jealous of Michael and I right now for eating this awesome meal? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You can do this too. Look at he's following along. Now that you have all these notes and the recipes, you guys got this. Um, all right. So gravy. Really quick before we start cooking this gravy, we have just one knife skill that I want to uh, show you. And that's just cutting our parsley. This is going to be our finishing touch for our um, gravy just to make it pop. So with parsley, basically I just wanna make sure I take off some of the big stems. A little bit of stem is completely fine, but some of the big stems I just don't want. But I don't waste a lot of time trying to clean this up perfectly. That's really as much time as I take. Then I'm going to keep this in a really nice tight pile, okay? And once again, starting with the tip of my knife down. Have a little. Okay. Tip of the knife down, slide and glide forward. And it's this nice rocking motion that my knife is doing the work. I'm not bruising any of my herbs. And then once it's small, I can do this mincing motion, this rocking back and forth where I have a couple fingers on top, but less is more when it comes to chopping fresh herbs, okay? The less you chop them, the more flavor they retain. And so when I am storing parsley, I tend to store all of my herbs in Ziploc bags. Um, and I store them around with a moist paper towel wrapped around them. Um, and somewhere in the middle of your refrigerator, okay? Never in those crisping drawers. Too much moisture is in those drawers, and that's really what makes your uh, herbs die quicker is all that moisture. Sometimes I'll even throw my parsley in a mason jar filled with just like a quarter inch of water, um, and that'll help preserve them for longer too. But I can appreciate that not everybody has enough room in their fridge for a mason jar full of a parsley bouquet. All right, so gravy time. All gravies start with a roux. A roux is equal parts butter and flour. Now, I realize that in Chicago right now, the sun is beating down really hard. So I'll try to block off as much of that light as possible so you can see this a little better. But melted butter and flour, my all-time favorite tool in the kitchen. 
my flat whisk, okay? I'm not using a balloon whisk. I'm using a flat whisk that I can keep on the bottom of my pan and really incorporate all that butter and flour together to create my roux and get into all those nooks and crannies. I thought I had a lump of flour, but it turns out that that was just a piece of turkey. This is why we build our gravy in the same pan. That way we can get all of that wonderful turkey flavor. You want to make sure that you cook your roux over a medium heat and you can see that it's starting to foam. It's starting to bubble a little bit. You need to make sure you cook it for at least two minutes, okay? Because with this gravy, if you don't cook out that roux first and you start to add all of your juices and your stock and your white wine, this is when we're gonna start ending up with lumpy gravy. So we cook our roux for at least a minute or two while it's bubbling. For this, we're actually gonna deglaze with some white wine. Okay, once we add our white wine, we can turn up our heat to a high heat. Make sure you get into all of those nooks and crannies, all those corners. You can see it's already starting to thicken up. The wine is gonna give us some acidity to balance the, uh, the richness of the stock and all the other um, ingredients. Once you notice that this is nice and thick, you can see it leaving trails in my, um, my pan. Then I can start adding my chicken stock, okay? When I'm adding my chicken stock, I am on high heat. I am slowly pouring my stock and constantly whisking. I'm whisking into all crevices of my pan, making sure that it's going everywhere. If I were to just dump all my stock in at once, once again, we'd end up with lumpy gravy. Once you notice that you're incorporating nicely, no lumps are happening, you can go ahead and put the rest of it in there. Get those sides of the pan. And now we have to bring this whole thing up to a boil. Once we bring it up to a boil, that's going to activate the rest of the, uh, the flour. It's going to start to thicken. And we're going to just let this uh, simmer and boil until we reach our desired consistency. And that's really preferential. Ideally, I like to have my gravy coat the back of my spoon and not be... Um, too thick where it gets, where it clumps. All right. Any questions so far about gravy? You can see it starting to boil now. I'm just gonna move my parsley out of the way to finish this. So while that is simmering, I'm gonna add my pomegranates to my salad. Now, when I'm dressing my salad, I like to dress the sides of my bowl. So I just go all around the sides as it seeps down. Once I go to mix this up, I'm gonna get evenly coated without um, weighing down any of my, my greens. So when you're dressing your salad, dress the bowl, not the greens. That's my tip and trick there. Now, of course, we can't forget our butternut squash. 
This is another reason why I like to use the foil. I just kind of shake it off. That way it falls right in. All right. Oh my gosh, this smells so good. So good. Now I'm just gonna take a little scoop of dressing to make sure I get that butternut squash all mixed up. And once you dress your salad, make sure that you are tasting it. Make sure you taste the greens. I know we seasoned our vinaigrette, but once it gets all tossed together, you never know if it needs any more seasoning. Which I for sure need a little bit of salt and a little bit of pepper. And if you're not a big fan of kale, I highly suggest trying to find, you know, this nice baby kale. It's a lot more palatable than the bigger leaves of kale, but any kind of greens would work in this salad. But look at all those beautiful colors. And then for just another added texture, I do have some walnuts that we can sprinkle over the top. And these have just been toasted in a 350 degree oven for about eight to 10 minutes, just until lightly golden brown. So you have some sweet and some tart from the apples and the pomegranates. You have this wonderful crunch from the walnuts. You have this really uh, herbaceous green kale, the ultimate autumn salad. So we're just gonna set that aside. Our gravy is working and thickening. So let's talk about slicing. Um, so when you go to take off your twine, you can always use um, some scissors, leftover parsley. Um, but if you cut off the, the side that you, um, that you went under the back side, you can find your seam where where you rolled your um your roulade together, and you can usually just cut right down that seam, and it'll come right off in one shot. Any other questions so far? Can you repeat how you roasted the walnuts, please? Oh, yes, of course. So on a sheet tray, and this is how I roast all nuts, on a sheet tray with some parchment or a sew pad, um, 350 degrees for about eight to 10 minutes. And I say about because all I'm really looking for is nice, even golden brown. And anything above 350 degrees is just a little too hot for the nuts. Their essential oil starts seeping out. All right, so I think I got all my twine. Always make sure you're double checking that you've got all your twine. You never wanna accidentally serve people with twine. All right, so when I'm presenting this, I always wanna make sure that my seam side is down. When we go to slice, I really try to slice these as thin as possible. That way, you know, people can always go back for seconds. I'm just using my chef's knife because it is quite um, sharp right now. This isn't a really large piece of meat. If it was larger, I'd want to have um, a slicing knife, a long slender blade. But you guys, let me try to see if I can get this nice little pinwheel for you. Look nice. at how cool that looks, right? Totally cooked through all the way. All of my turkey is nice and opaque, but it's still really juicy. And even the center, I mean, you can see the juice is just dripping right off of there. And, you know, the 
stuffing just makes it more interesting. You can experiment with different flavors of stuffing, different kinds of stuffing. Any questions so far? Last thing I'm gonna do is just have a little bit of parsley in my gravy. And you guys, I wanna show you this nice and close up. Look at this gravy. So it coats the back of my spoon, but it's not too thick. It's just meant to complement the turkey, not overpower it. And you gotta remember, oh yeah. You gotta remember when you are making gravy, once it starts cooling down, say you put it in a gravy boat on your um, table for Thanksgiving, it will start to thicken up. So it's always better to air on slightly thinner than you might think than trying to get it to be really, really thick. And then all of a sudden it's, it's really, you know, viscous at your, your table. Oh yeah, any kind of herbs would be really nice in this gravy. You could leave it out. I mean, you saw that, you know, with this brown turkey, the parsley's really just there to, to brighten it up, to give it an element of garnish. Um, you can do sage to complement your filling. You can do um, other herbs. Or yeah, you can always just omit the herbs in the gravy. George, yes, always taste. I don't know if you guys saw me, but I tasted my gravy. And then add a pinch of salt or pepper if you think it's necessary, for sure. Oh, for sure. Yeah, you can use thyme for that as well. Mm -hmm. That way everything kind of goes together without, you know, overpowering each other. Colleen, I wish you can try all this too. <laughs> Are there any other questions? That is all I got for you for today. I'm really excited for you to go and try to make all of these recipes. I hope you had as much fun as I did. Michael, I want you to post your pictures in our Chopping Block Facebook group. I want to see how your dinner turns out as well as everybody else here, right? If you guys didn't know that, we do have... Um, a TCB will get you cooking private Facebook group. It's where we post all of our pictures, have tons of cooking challenges. I'm really excited for you for your dinner today. Great. One question that I think we might have skipped over from Rana. If you're cooking at 350, um, how long would it take the turkey breast to reach the desired temperature? Ooh, that's a good question. And it really just depends on the size of the turkey. At 350, it's going to take longer. You figure for an average turkey breast, it's about three pounds. So you're looking probably closer at 45 minutes or so. Um, Valerie's asking, is it too early to break into the potatoes? Probably so. Probably, but hey, we'll do it. And Michael, yes, we prefer uh, ceramic pans rather than glass always yes yes for sure all right let me show you this dun, 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 dun. and you can see that it kind of died down a little bit right you don't see as much liquid there it is starting to thicken up i'm just going to put a little bit in this full disclosure i generally make you know presentation plates but i forgot all my pretty plates today so <laughs> Andrea was probably wondering why I didn't plate up anything. All right, so you can see at the bottom, still a little wet, but not the end of the world. This is gonna be my, my breakfast tomorrow, if nobody comes by. <laughs> there you go, people. If you are in Chicago and you're ordering, you should go there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's still a little wet, but it's definitely thickening up. The layers look so good though. Look at all that cheese in between. Yeah, so we normally let that sit probably another 20 minutes before cutting into it. Yes. 
you know, you can come in today if you place orders for pickup. Our stars are still not open to the public yet, um, but if you place an order, then you can pick up between 12 and 5 and you can get samples of all the yummy food Lisa and Hans made today. Uh, Joanne, I think you're asking why we prefer ceramic instead of glass. Uh, that would be because of its ability to conduct heat more evenly. With glass, you get hot spots. That is true. Linda, thanks for hanging out all day. I'm so glad you liked all three of the demos. Yes, I know we had a lot of people do all three, so thank you very much. And for those of you that just joined us for, um, we don't have any pickup hours on Sunday. It's just 12 to 5 today, and then we go back to our normal hours, which are Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, three to five. All right. Well, thanks, Chef Lisa. We will let everybody go because I know there's some of us that have been here all day. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much for your support. Um, again, you can place your order today and get your discount 20% off retail, 10% off wine and spirits. Just shoot that email over to Lincoln at the chopping block. We'll contact you for payment and then to schedule your uh, pick up. All right. And if, like Lisa said, if you guys have follow up questions or, you know, when you start to make this at home, you have questions, you can always find us on our private Facebook group. All right. Everybody enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you. Bye guys. Thank you.